realtors have vacant homes. At Pest Properties, ours come occupied and ready to invest. Looking to relocate your larvae? Try the Petri Residence. This rustic home features thousands of crevices to squirm in through, vaulted ceilings for our wall crawlers, and an outdoor bird bath teeming with mosquito eggs. So kick up your six hairy legs and sign today. Before pests move in, Terminix it. With over 95 years of experience, we'll help keep your home off the pest market. Visit Terminix.com today. It's Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that all children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. I here on the Mutual Audio Building with my co-host David Alt for the Sonic Society, the world's largest showcase of modern audio drama. David, do you have any thoughts as to the recent using of the term audio fiction to describe audio drama? That's an interesting one because I suppose my thoughts on it are to do with whether there is a narrator or not and how key the narrator is to it because audio drama to me is more like the old time radio where there is little to no narrator whereas Mm. audio fiction seems to be more narrator based with voices yeah i guess i would have called that podcast fiction in that respect for that reason like Mm -hmm. i I think i called them pod fix when they first came out because like you Mm -hmm. said there's a lot of those shows that are sort of like serial and the Black Tapes podcast mm-hmm. and Rabbits yep. and stuff like that. And they would say, you know, I got this really weird story and I'm telling you over the microphone, right? So, you know, mm, there's yes. there's very little, there's definitively a broken fourth but the, wall there. But but then, then yes, there, there is a, there's the fourth wall, which I would say would be more the podcasting fiction, but a narrator to me doesn't break the fourth wall. Yeah, you know what? This is, I just finished writing a script and you're right. A narrator is in the story. Yes. An announcer is not. Or a exactly. host, and yeah, I, yeah. I was—that's mm-hmm. why I've been throwing in the word announcer when I, the announcer is sort of announcing what's going on in the story, but the narrator, you're right, is a narration. So, mm-hmm. yeah, good point. Very good point. Yeah, I know it's a hornet's nest with some people, and I've written extensively on the website about it, kind of thing. I mm-hmm. sometimes worry that we bite off our nose to spite our face by mm-hmm. identifying too much as audio fiction. Mm-hmm. So people tend to sort of rename things to kind of fraction off the listening audience even more, and we can't afford that as a group. <laughs> we need to build a larger group than a smaller one, and so the English teacher and me just doesn't like the inaccuracy in that respect. I have no problem against audio fiction. I love listening to audiobooks and and such. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But when they're effectively audio drama, like you say, like old time in that respect or movies. I mean, you mm-hmm. wouldn't sit there and say I'm going to the theaters to listen to a book mm-hmm. in the same mm-hmm. way unless somebody's actually standing there and reading it. You go there to mm-hmm. watch a movie. And so these are audio movies, audio drama. I I see mm-hmm. as that yeah, so, but I, I think I think in terms of the listening audience, what is so wonderful about this particular time mm-hmm. is that there are so many audio drama podcasts out there. There's so much audio content, yes, uh, and so the I, I think more than ever before, the idea of listening to uh, a podcast, listening to a story. Mm-hmm is higher in people's minds than than I think it has been for a long time. I agree. It's interesting, like growing up, I think another aspect of this too is that I think, and this is not meant to be denigrating whatsoever, but I think we've gone a number of decades, the regular listening public, without really knowing how to listen to audio drama. Mm -hmm. And so when you have audio fiction, when Mm -hmm. you have a really strong narrator, it's a really easier way in. I remember growing up as a kid, all the kids' audio drama had a narrator helping people through every single Mm. scene and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. In some ways, it could be a starter for people who have not listened to stuff as well. And again, Mm -hmm. I uh, my tendency is always to try to keep the narration down unless it's Mm -hmm. specifically for a certain kind of genre. So noir detective stuff, 
usually has really strong narration. Mm -hmm. Also, when I write fantasy, I kind of want to put a narrator in there because there's just so much action and sometimes you want to paint a really clear picture and all those kinds Mm -hmm. of things. So Mm -hmm. my narration usually has to do with a really strong purpose. When they like describe to you what they're doing and then you hear the actors talk about it and then you have sound effects with the actors talking about it, it kind of feels like it's overdone that way. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, he looks over and picks up glasses. Don't take us out of the story that way, you know, or else we're... Mm -hmm. We're gone. But again, these are just preferences, right? I, I, mm-hmm, I love yes. a variety of stuff, and I love when people get to play with all that stuff, mm-hmm. too. Yes, definitely. Well, we have a moment or two to talk about some upcoming things in Mutual and Electric Vicuna, speaking of how to do stuff. Last month, thanks to Nazrim, I got to finish off several projects, including three more Wavefront shorts and a darker mm. musing show, a couple of which, if memory serves, you've got a role. And I think I might do, yes, yes. (laughs) Something called Reservations. Absolutely, uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, Monkey's Paw. Yes. I never think I can write comedy well, but once in a while I get something and it just, it it tickles my fancy, so I have to write it regardless. (laughs) The Amigos with Jeff Billard and Lothar Toppin have started a new Sonic Echo season with me, with Noir. We're also delving to several projects, including Bill Hallwig's favorite old-time radio series. That's just a monster. And some great... Great news from Jeff Billard. He's creating a Western and adventure series as well. I'm excited about both of those. So uh, what's new in your world? What's really new in my world is the fact that uh, usually these interactions are very scripted. (laughs) (laughs) And... and (laughs) And for once, uh, the script that I have received, uh, dearest listeners, um, is Jack with his with his scripted line, David, response. <laughs> scripted line, David, response. <laughs> scripted line, David. And, and it's just it, that that's very new for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I hate improv. So <laughs> Jack's always scripted. Everyone else can improv. It's wonderful. Yes, it's just John indeed. Bell, how does he do that all the time? He improvs constantly through his show. He doesn't it's, really it's have a script incredible. for most of the time. Yeah, oh, it's, it's incredible. He is, he, is a, he is an amazing performer. Yeah. Which Absolutely. we'll get to see in MadCon, as if you got your tickets for 2022 now, we'll be talking more mm. about that in upcoming shows, trust me. Absolutely. But but this week, yes. this week, let us talk about what is happening today on the Sonic Certainly. Society. Well, this week, and to save David from any more improvisation, we have <laughs> Benjamin Peels, the showman, the diver, and the padre from Breakwater Theatre Company, and it all begins right here. No, I've forgotten my line. <laughs> Oh, on the Sonic Society. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> And so the end is nigh. But before that, Uncle Harold, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, little Jimmy and the Bunko Kit have a limerick for you. Can't you two ever leave me alone? You tormented me in life, though I didn't always know it. And now, even in this purgatory, you upstage me. <laughs> there once was a vicar whose stiff key meant he lived a life way too carefree and ended up defrocked by which he was so shocked that he breached hellfire down by the sea. <laughs> Have you managed to turn your key yet, Uncle Harold? When I do, I'll be free of you both. Well, I wouldn't be so sure of that. You'll just stay trapped as always. One day I'll escape, and then you two will cease to exist. <laughs> cease to exist? Cease to exist? <laughs> will you two please leave me alone? Be like that, then. We know when to make our exit. For now, anyway. That was always your problem. Too many different aspects of your character competing for attention. I know that now. But you two are the worst of my personalities. Forever tormenting me. Just please leave me alone. Uh, You can vary the script to a certain degree, but the denouement is always the same. It's all right. They've gone now. You know, when they buried me, they managed to place my headstone so that it faces the wrong way. 
I guess I was always out of step for my whole life and career. I must get ready now, though, as Mr. Butlin is about to introduce me again. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name is Billy Butlin. Welcome to my holiday camp here in Skegness, which I hope will be the first of many. And may I say that I believe you to be like the pioneers of the old Wild West by coming here full of the sense of spirit and adventure. My colleagues and staff have filled you in on how it all works, but I am here to tell you about some very special entertainment that we have laid on for you later tonight. So, for your delectation and with no expense spared, we have two incredible acts which have to be seen to be believed. First of all, please welcome to the stage the daredevil high diver, Mr. Leslie Gadsby. Applause, please. Thrill to his acrobatic skill as he plunges from great height, performing twists and turns. I won't tell you what his finale is, as that would spoil the surprise. But believe me, you don't want to miss it. And if that were not enough, please put your hands together for the fully exonerated Reverend Harold Davidson and his Daniel and the Lion Act. Gasp! as he enters the lion's den and reenacts the famous biblical story. Marvel at his encounter with these deadly beasts. It's almost as if he has the strength of three men. Will he survive the confrontation? Be sure to find out, for after all, our true intent is all for your delight. You're going to wear the floor out at this rate, Mr. Davidson. Why has he got us waiting in the theatre? I know he's a busy man at the moment, but how much longer can he keep us waiting? My father's going to start to wonder where I've got to. He doesn't know you are here. No. It's never good to keep secrets, Gadsby. Well, depending on what Mr. Butlin says, he might not find out. And do you have a proposal for Mr. Butlin? I have, yes. And might I inquire what that is? I take it you've not heard of the Gadsbys, then? Not unless you are of a theatrical bent. I myself have trod the boards in my youth. No. Me and my father are high divers. We perform our routine from Skegness Pier. I see. What did you do when you trod the boards? I once had the privilege of playing Lord Fancourt Babbley in Charlie's Aunt, who becomes the aunt from Brazil. You know where... The nuts come from. You know it, then. Believe it or not, we do have a good theatre scene here in Skegness. Entertainment is changing so quickly these days. I myself have lived through so many inventions and innovations. It's exciting, isn't it, to be living through so much change? I'm not sure that it is. The modern world seems to be getting quicker and quicker. Everyone's always in a hurry and wanting to know everyone else's business through ever more intrusive mass media and communications. But, as my father says, some traditions continue. Perhaps... But they seem to be under increasing threat. We still draw a good crowd. I sometimes wish I had been able to stick with the theatre. Why didn't you? I had another calling. But now I have gone back to performing for the masses in a rather more crude way than I would wish. 
And is that why you're here? That is between myself, Mr. Butlin, and God. From what I've heard, Mr. Butlin may as well be God around here. Please do not take the Lord's name in vain. It was a joke. Yes, well, forgive me. I'm feeling the strain at the moment. I hope that the Skegness crowds will be rather more receptive to me than the somewhat vulgar Blackpool ones. I wouldn't count on it. No? Well, you are probably right. The seaside resorts are full of the uncouth, uneducated masses, but I must continue with my mission in spite of it. No, because of it, rather. Your mission? The heathen flock must be preached to if they are to be saved. How does it feel when you are stood high up on your platform? It feels like... like... there's no past or present, just the now. I think I would rather be like St. Simeon sometimes, and stay up somewhere like that forever. Who? St. Simeon. He spent 37 years living atop a pillar in holy devotion. Perhaps you feel the hand of God upon you as you plunge downwards to guide you safely. No, I trust in my ability and the skills my father taught me. And yet, by your presence here, you think to abandon him? There comes a time when you should know you have to leave the stage. And you think your father has reached it? No, not yet. But this act requires nerve as well as skill. And you think your father's nerve is going? It's starting to. Very slowly. The crowd can't tell yet, but I can. And can you continue the act alone? My father did for a while, as did my grandfather. A family affair, then. I myself come from a long line of clergymen. My father was a... He was a what? He was a disciplinarian. I may not have appreciated it at the time, but with the loose morals that are everywhere these days, I think he was right to be one. Loose morals? Even here in Skegness? The seaside resorts, in my opinion, are just as bad as the vice dens of Soho. I have yet to find out. You should not joke about straying from the path. Will you know when the time has come for you to stop and hand over the baton? I think so. Don't get me wrong. Nerves are good. Necessary, even. But when you see the faintest flicker of fear, then... Yes, well, I have shown nerve in my lifetime. And now I will have to summon up more, even at this age. What did you do in Blackpool? If you must know, I preached from a barrel. Why? Do you mean to say that you do not know who I am? Do you not peruse the popular press? No, I don't much follow the news. That, my dear boy, I must say I find rather gratifying. Where is this Mr. Butlin? But people say my timekeeping is tawdry. I'd imagine Mr. Butlin is a very busy man right now. Yes, so I hear. Building this holiday camp which has the potential to become a breeding ground for sin and fornication. It's just a place for people to have a break. Where did this Butlin get the wherewithal to get something like this up and running? Mr Butlin's a self-made man, and a very good judge of character, according to my father. In what capacity did your father know him? Mr Butlin took his act on when he first started here in Skegness. Then there is who? That he might be open to new acts in another fresh venture. That is what I'm hoping. When did you first start building it? Last October. I can't see them taking off myself. Why are you here if you think that? I am a man who can turn his hand to many skills. I approached the editor of the local paper, the Skegness Standard, offering to write cult Cultivated articles on any number of topics. And what did he say? The gist of it was that if I wrote like I spoke, the readers might have difficulty in following my erudite discourses. Hmm. But no matter. Tell me, 
as it has been intriguing me. Did you lose your hand during one of your routines? I was performing with my father at Western Supermare, and I fired the maroon to start the morning performance. But the damn rocket rebounded off the pier and smashed right into my hand, which then had to be cut off. An unfortunate accident, then. You have my sympathies. Thank you. We were in a bit of a rush that day. We're usually so careful. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I lost my left hand. Well, it still applies. Does that nonsense you just spouted apply to legs too? The Bible is not nonsense, young man, and what do you mean? My father only has one leg. Are you not seen, if you will excuse the Americanism, as a bit of a freak sideshow then? No, we're not, and I resent that. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Deep in discussion, are we? (laughs) Right, I suggest we get some fresh air. I've got business I need to attend to. Come, follow me. As you can appreciate with the camp due to open in less than a month, I'm a very busy man. Why were we waiting in the theatre? Well, you were both showmen, or at least you claim to be. What better place to observe you both first? You mean you were spying on us? As I said, observing. I can tell a lot from how would-be performers carry themselves, whether in the public eye or not. My father always tells me that. Actually, I go in there for a few minutes every day to collect my thoughts. It must be a stressful time right now. Yes. Well, a new venture always is. But there's nothing like an empty theatre to remind you of what you've taken on. Well, I've always had good audiences. But in my theatre, the shows will have to suit the audiences. What are we doing here, anyway? Well, this, gentlemen, is how I started to make some serious money. Of these dodgy cards? Yes, I spotted a gap in the market, and I took it. I also hold the licence to export them to Europe. Very impressive. A passing fad. I've always relied on my ability to spot opportunities before others. I saw that people were not going to traditional fairs like they used to, but instead were going to the seaside. And you followed them? To Skegnet? I met someone at Olympia who seemed to have a bob or two, and he said he had a few stalls here. So I came and I started an amusement park. Mind you, when I I first heard of Skegness, I thought it was in Scotland. But what gave you the idea of a holiday camp? I saw and know from first hand myself that there was nothing much at seaside resorts in terms of either accommodation or entertainment. So you sought to bring them together in some kind of unholy reverse serendipity? You are not the first by any means, though. I have to say... I know that I'm not the first, but nothing has been attempted on this scale before. I'm surprised the authorities didn't object. When I explained my plans and they saw the local employment opportunities, (laughs) they soon came around. Right. I'm a very busy man, and to save time, I intend to hear both of your proposals together. I trust you have no objections. Fine by me. Mr. Davidson. Very well, I suppose. May I be permitted to speak first? Why not? I'm dying to find out what his proposal is. Especially as I gather he's a vicar of some sort. Well, I take it from that remark that you don't know who this distinguished fellow is. I did not come here to be mocked, sir. I do not intend to mock you, sir. But surely our young friend here should know who you are. Fine. I have done nothing that I am ashamed of. 
Mr. Davidson was a vicar of a parish in Norfolk, but he was defrocked four years ago. Why? He was found guilty of immorality. Consorting with young streetwalkers in London, is that not so? It is true that I was found guilty, but I intend to clear my name. And how do you intend to do that? I know that you have a zoo in Skegness with lions. I would like to perform a modern-day Daniel act. That is, I would... Yes, yet I get the idea. But what gave you the idea? It was suggested to me by... I mean, it came to me in a dream. So, you want to perform this at my zoo? That was my original idea, yes. But then I heard about your new holiday camp opening and I thought it would be even better here with a captive audience. I believe you are in need of entertainers. I could even minister to the campers. You seem to be forgetting that you are no longer a vicar. No matter. I believe that issue will soon be rectified. And why would I want to run the risk of my customers seeing your untimely demise in my new camp? I have been to your zoo and your lions seem pretty docile to me. Well, let me tell you. I have had experiences of trying to train lions myself, as well as getting into trouble with authorities over a supposed escaped one. I leave animal training to the professionals these days. I would only be inside the cage for a few minutes at most. I intend to study and train intensively. At the same time as fighting to clear your name. Gadsby, you've been very quiet. What do you think to Mr. Davidson's idea? I don't really know. Well, never mind then. So, what's your proposal for me? I'd like to bring my high dive act here. Your high dive act? So, is this without your father? Yes, without. And why is that? I think it's time I struck out on my own. There's nothing wrong with that sentiment. If, of course, you are really ready. I know you employed my father in your early days here in Skegness. I did, yes, and it's only out of respect to him that I agreed to see you. This gentleman accosted and badgered my staff so much that out of curiosity from what I've read in the papers did I agree to see him also. Why don't I give you a demonstration of what I intend to do? Do you have a chair? There's one just there on the rides booth. I presume that if I did take you on, I would have to extend the diving platform at the swimming pool so there's one for your use only. I'm sure it's possible. Yes, most things are if you have the money and the inclination. Here, hold the back of the chair, would you, Mr. Davidson? Right, one of my basic dives is the swallow. One where I just launch myself straight out from the platform with my arms in front of me like so. Yes, it's me, little Jimmy again. And I says that's quite enough of this. <clears throat> I needs to show Billy Boy what your idea is, Uncle Harold. But I will look stupid. Not that the bunko kid will care. He likes making me look a fool. Well, first of all, we need to stop this silly boy's high-diving demonstration. How do we do that? Ooh, I've got an idea. Introduce us as an act. To this audience? They seem either half asleep or about to shuffle off their mortal coil. Now that's Skegness for you. Right, come on, get on with it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please put your hands together for... For what, exactly? Oh dear, you can tell who the straight man is, can't you? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for your entertainment in delectation, a salutary lesson in verse, showing how to know when it is time to leave your chosen stage. <clears throat> Poised above the pier, Gadsby ponders, as he composes and comports himself. Maybe it is some sort of salvation. Perhaps a precipitate purgatory condemnation. To desirously repeat this decidedly, demonstrably declining daily deed of damnation. Feet to the edge 
edge of the high platform, the daredevil diver divines down on the swell of that surging way beneath him, addresses his apperception to what's ahead and below, and reflects on his father's firm forewarnings that anticipatory alacrity speeds the show. The captious congregation calms. A dramatic pause. Then a perfect swallow dive as he artfully arcs into air. Time stands still, bated breath. Followed by an almost silent splash. Infinite eternal pause. Tangible tension explodes as the contrary clapping crowd calls for more. As a senescent Gatsby swims for sure. Hee <laughs> hee! That's hopefully scuppered that young idiot diver's chances. How oh, has it? We praised him more than anything. The bunko kid, that's me. Likes making Uncle Harold suffer. If you had been listening carefully, you would have realized that we were portraying him near the end of his career, where, like his father, his nerve was starting to go. But that doesn't help us now. Oh, stop being such an old woman all the time. I blame the Bunko Kid's influence. Can I tell my joke now? Oh, you can for me. I think this audience can take it. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a pedant died and went to heaven. When he got to the pearly gates, St. Peter told him that new rules were in effect due to the advances of education. In order to gain admittance, a prospective heavenly soul must answer two questions. We haven't time for this. I don't trust you to keep it clean. Right, you two. I want you to pretend to be two lions. Ah, the bunko kid also likes to be humiliated. Little Jimmy prefers Uncle Harold to get into trouble. No! That's pathetic. You are supposed to be lions, so roar! 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 So what I propose is this. I will stand outside the cage for a few minutes and recite a passage from the Bible. Something from the book of Daniel, perhaps. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. (sighs) That were boring. Don't upset, Mr. Butlin, we need this. Then I will enter the lion's den for a few minutes to show my tormentors that I am innocent. How will you do that? He will have God on his side. He will meet his maker. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Just one roar, and he'll be quaking in his boots. Are you all right, Mr. Davidson? You were explaining your act to us, and then you just stopped. Perfectly fine, thank you. Good. Well, I'm a busy man, so I'll cut to the chase. Mr. Davidson, I believe your proposal to be the most foolhardiest one I've had the misfortune to hear in a long time. Mr. Butlin, I must protest. You're being very short-sighted. Does this... You can protest all you like. But you've wasted enough of my time. Your act will not be part of my new venture. Good day to you then, sir. But you are making a mistake. I've no doubt he'll persuade someone to put it on. Right then, Gadsby. I don't know about you, but I could do with a drink. Good evening, Leslie. I trust you are well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Butlin. Call me Bill. I'm not your employer after all. It must be over a year since I last saw you. Yes, it must be. It looks like there's quite a crowd already. I saw your performance earlier today. 
you both have some very good routines and you know how to work the crowd. Thank you. You know, I think you were right not to take me on. Maybe, maybe not. I'm still not sure how much life is left in acts like yours, but I've been wrong before. Lord knows we were struggling for entertainment though when we first opened. I don't think I was ready to leave my father that time I saw you. And I'm still not. It's thanks to speaking to Mr. Davidson back then that made me realise just how good he has been to me. Then you are lucky. I never really knew my father. I know losing my hand was an accident, but for a long time I was so angry about it that I looked for someone to blame. And the nearest person was your father? Yes, but I've learned to let it go now. So what if some people think us a bit freakish? That's their problem. We still enjoy what we're doing. Well, that's all that counts in the end. I think the world of my mother, but my father... Well, how can you miss someone who's never really been there? I remember Mr Davidson telling me that his father was rather strict with him. That's as may be. But I don't think that's where all his problems stem from. You don't think you were wrong not to sign him up? No, not at all. I hear he's been doing this four times a day. You have to admire his bravery. I'd call it foolhardiness myself. Perhaps. You know, I saw him with a young girl the other day. Oh, yes? It's not what you might think. He didn't see me, but I heard them both talking. She was in some distress. He was comforting her because she'd argued with her parents about her boyfriend and had run off from them. They turned up angry and upset, but he managed to calm them all down. Well, I never thought he was all bad. And how many of us can cast the first stone? I hear you're expanding all the time. Clapton next, isn't it? It is. Yes, but I don't have a moment to myself. Tell me, do you ever have doubts when you're about to launch into one of your dives? I do my best to eliminate doubt. But I always weigh up the risks. Well, that's a very sound approach to life and show business. I'm not sure Mr. Davidson has ever followed it, though. I thought we might have seen Mr. Davidson before it started. Perhaps it's just as well we haven't. Show business can create some very strange bedfellows. But none as strange as him. Poor man. We've succeeded in show business not just because we were born into it, but because we paid our dues along the way, too. He thinks he can just become a showman overnight. He's a peculiar fellow, all right? Yes, he most certainly is. I wonder what he's been doing since he was last here. A friend in Blackpool tells me he's been making a bit of a nuisance of himself there. Doing what? His barrel act has led him to being fined for breaching the peace and causing an obstruction. I also heard he got himself arrested at Victoria Station. What for? Pestering two 16-year-old girls. Uh, here he is now. Gather round, gather round, please do. Now you've probably heard all about me, I've no doubt. But for those of you that haven't, I have been treated most grievously by the church leadership. All I sought to do was God's work among the fallen women of our society. For wasn't Mary Magdalene the harlot before becoming a saint? Archbishop Lang and Bishop Pollock should hang their heads in shame for what they have done to me. And I also extort you not to stay at Mr. Butlin's new holiday camp up the road, for, as the paper said only the other week, it is a hotbed of vice and iniquity. Can that brazen idiot see me? That slander, how long does he do this for? About ten minutes, I've been told. God, this belongs in the, in the last century. It's all very well for you people. You only have to listen to me once. But what about the poor lions? They hear the same spiel four times a day. One of them had me cornered yesterday. I don't know what they will do to me tonight. Let's see, shall we? I don't know if it's the fairground man in me, but I've got a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I know what you mean. 
At least when I'm diving, I feel like I'm in control. Yes, but this is too unpredictable. And so is he. Well, he's survived a few shows already. I'm going to hide in the crowd. I, I don't want to put him off. Come on, you two. Get a move on. These people are here for a show. Hee-hee! <laughs> <laughs> We're back! The Bonko Kid, that's him. And little Jimmy. Uh, yeah, that's me. See, have we still got the same audience? I don't think anyone's left it. Can I tell my joke now? Yeah, why not? Uncle Harold is otherwise engaged. <laughs> Great. A pedant died and went to heaven. When he got to the pearly gates, St. Peter told him that new rules were in effect due to the advances of education. In order to gain admittance, a prospective heavenly soul must answer two questions. Now, name two days of the week beginning with T, and how many seconds are there in a year? A pedant thought for a few minutes and answered, The two days of the week that begin with T are today and tomorrow. There are twelve seconds in a year. St. Peter said, well, all right, I'll, I'll buy the today and tomorrow answer, even though it's not what I expected. <laughs> but how did you get 12 seconds in a year? And the pedant replied, well, there's January the 2nd, February 2nd, March the 2nd. St. <laughs> Peter opens the gate without another word. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for your entertainment and delectation, another salutary lesson in verse, showing how to know when it is time to leave your chosen stage. <clears throat> On a sultry, shimmering summer's evening, a coarse and curious crowd gathers by a cage of a somnolent, sweltering, sticky seafront. Ambiguous ambivalence looms loud. In some, a malevolent mood takes hold as they wonder at what is about to unfold. A defrocked, disgraced, destitute, defiant, vicar of Stifke sets forth his final sermon and, ignoring the derisory cat calls, enters the lion's den ready to extol the classical Christian martyrdom. But Freddy's become bored of his supporting role and attacks this amateur Daniel. Thus, by this final act, the book is written. Chapter and verse ends, and a man whose past arraignment forced him into a feckless living with constant cheap and cheerful entertainment, preaching morality to those by whom he was unjustly judged. Back! Freddy! No! Get back! No! What's happening, Leslie? I, I can't see through this crowd. My God, he's carrying him around like a cat with a mouse. Is nobody going to do anything? A young girl. She's just gone into the cage. What's happening? Some people have managed to make the lion drop him. Poor, deluded fool. They've managed to drag him out. Well, he's found fame at last, whether he lives or not. I need some fresh air. This is not entertainment. Not all the crowd is moving away. Ghoulish fascination. And so the end is nigh. But before that, Uncle Harold, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, little Jimmy and the Bunko Kid have a limerick for you. Can't you two ever leave me alone? You tormented me in life, though I didn't always know it. And now, even in this purgatory, you upstage me. There once was a vicar whose stiff key... Meant he lived a life way too carefree. He ended, ended up defrocked by, by which he was, was so shocked, shocked he, he preached hellfire down, down by the sea. sea. <laughs> well, that's a limerick that some wag made up. Two musicals about his life were made, but both of them were flops, though. Please, leave me alone. Uh, didn't help that they both featured dream sequences, which is perhaps what this is, though. <laughs> Ooh, I, I'm expecting a chorus line of high-kicking ex-prostitutes in stockings to come dancing on stage, singing a song of thanking Uncle Harold for saving them. <laughs> no? Oh. Oh, well, that's a shame. Oh, what is artistic success, anyway? 
Is it diving from a high platform and trusting your skill and judgment? Oh, I guess there's a kind of purity to it that I can respect. And young Gatsby carried it on into his middle age. Is success and fame opening a chain of holiday camps for cheap and cheerful entertainment? Billy Butlin's name lives on, though, and perhaps cheap and cheerful is what Uncle Harold became in the end. Will you two please leave me alone? Ah, oh, be like that then. We know when to make our exit. For now, anyway. Oh, that were always a problem. Too many different aspects of your character competing for attention. It's all right. They've gone now. All I did my whole life was to play the hand that fate dealt me. What more can anyone do? I never saw fame or celebrity. All I ever wanted was to clear my name and go back to ministering my flock. I chose the only way I knew to keep my cause in the public eye. Fame is ephemeral anyway. Fame is like the theater or a show business act. A massive contract in which the audience agree to be complicit. It's like a moth drawn to a flame. It burns brightly for a short while, but then it withers and dies. You know, when they buried me, they managed to place my headstone so that it faces the wrong way. I guess I was always out of step for my whole life and career. I must get ready now, though, as Mr. Butlin is about to introduce me again. The Showman, the Diver and the Padre by Benjamin Peel Billy Butlin is played by Stacey Goff Harold Davidson by Edward Peel Leslie Gadsby by Daniel Blako and Little Jimmy and Bunko Kid by John Hewer Audio production by Jack Pudsey and directed by Sarah Beasley Produced for Sofa Festival 2020 by Sarah Beasley and Jack Pudsey for Breakwater Theatre Company. And that's this week's show. Please check the show notes for links to the shows this week at sonicsociety.org. Please be sure to contact us on all the various social media zines, including Twitter, at Sonic Society and at David Alt, Facebook through the Sonic Society group and Audio Drama Radio Drama Lovers, and of course we are a proud member of the Mutual Audio Network at mutualaudionetwork.com. Thanks so much for joining us this week, and please come by to the Sonic Society next week. We'll both be waiting. Until then, I'm David Alt. And I'm Jack Ward. Have a great day. Bye for now. That was scripted. the sonic society is written and produced weekly by jack j ward and david alt with original music by sharon b at sharonb.com All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Night. Sorry. Bye. It's not night anymore. <laughs> I keep forgetting not. that part. <laughs> can you tell I've been up since 3.30? All my, my, all I, my I writing can. is, yes. is yes. crazy, <laughs> and what I'm saying makes no sense. So, <laughs> And all of this is going in credits as well. This will be a fun credit section. <laughs> Plus, 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 <laughs> plus. <laughs> <laughs>
Sonic Society. Uh, Sorry? The Sonic Society 682 in which Jack gets very lazy. That's right. <laughs> David, response. <laughs> response. Well, every once response. in a while, you start going on about how these are well scripted and they, that you know, all the responses are scripted. And I said, I'll fix him. <laughs> no, it's not that at all. It's just like, what am I supposed to tell him? What What is my, my opinion that your opinion should be of audio fiction? <laughs> Go. <laughs> Oh. Okay, give, give me a second. All right. <laughs> that was brilliant. All right, go ahead. There are a number of everyday precautions that we can all take that may help to slow down the spread of the coronavirus. The first is to make sure to clean your hands often. Now, washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds is the best, but if you don't have that, try to use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. And to the extent possible, avoid touching high-touch surfaces in public places. These are things like elevator buttons, door handles, handrails, or of course handshaking with people. Wash your hands after touching surfaces in public places. Avoid touching your face, your nose, and your eyes. And clean and disinfect your home to remove germs. Practicing routine cleaning of frequently touched surfaces like tables, doorknobs, light switch handles will make a difference. Avoid crowds, especially in poorly ventilated spaces. All these small things that we can do may help to slow down the spread of the coronavirus. For more information, go to cdc.gov and be well, everyone. <laughs>